It's wonderful to be here. Uh, it's a very impressive conference, and I wonder if I'm at the right conference, because I'm going to talk about something a bit different. Um, I'm not a lobbyist, although I do a lot of fundraising. Um, what I do is try to imagine uh, the future of music in general, and especially how technology can expand our experience of music, both for professionals and for concert lovers, and pretty much for everybody in society. And as Andrea said, uh, my path in music has been really kind of unusual. Uh, I started out as a composer, and I often work with children, I often work with robots on stage, I work with people with various medical conditions. I've tried to imagine music as something central to all of our lives and to our cultures, and to, to try to think how we can make music touch all of us as deeply as possible, whatever it takes to do that. And uh, as Andrea said, that it did come from the very beginning, so in fact, those are my parents. I wasn't going to put that slide in, but since she mentioned that, I decided to. So in fact, my father is uh, a, a technology expert. He's one of the people who invented computer graphics. And my mother is a, not just a piano teacher, but a very, very creative piano teacher. And I, I, I think put technology and music together uh, from when I was very young as something that seemed important. And also, uh, my mother grew up in New York, very European, high culture background. My father grew up in the middle of the United States, uh, in Iowa. Uh, not that there's no culture there, but... <laughs> Anybody from Iowa before I... <laughs> um, but he was very, his whole family was very involved with popular culture. And so again, since I was a child, I was really interested in how to do serious, deep things that could change people's lives that also didn't have to be elitist and could touch as many people as possible. And as we all know, doing those things together is not easy, so I, I still work on that. Um, I went to Juilliard, uh, where I studied with Elliot Carter, you probably re recognize him, who is still, as you know, at the age of 103, writing better and better music. It's an incredible story. So that's another thing I tried to learn, is how to keep writing music when I'm 103, I don't know. Um, Pierre Boulez was at uh, the New York Philharmonic when I was at Juilliard, so he heard about me. I started working with technology when I was at Juilliard. I was really the only one doing that. So Boulez invited me to come to IRCOM at the very beginning, uh, first for one year, and I ended up staying for seven years, where I was uh, director of musical research uh, at age 22 or something, which was kind of a crazy thing for them and for me, but I learned quite a bit there. And then I got invited uh, to the Massachusetts Institute of Technology Media Lab, where I still am. And uh, this is, I, I'm not going to discuss this today, but at lunch, if anybody's interested, it is really quite a unique place because it's not a music center or an art center or a technology center. It's a place where we try to imagine how to make the quality of life better for as many people as possible any way we can. So my colleagues might be musicians or might be artists, but they might be ma people making robots that react with people. They might be people thinking about the future of learning. This person on the bottom, his name is Hugh Herr, who lost both his legs when he was age 17, climbing mountains. He was so upset with how bad the artificial legs were that he decided to devote his life to making the best artificial body parts possible. So now he tries to make future bodies that are better than our bodies. In fact, he, he, he's amazing. He's, he climbs mountains still, but when he climbs, he goes with kind of a bag, like a golf bag, with about 10 different pairs of legs. So, <laughs> so he has legs. He has legs for ice and legs for extensions and legs for... So he says, uh, you can't do that. So. so anyway, really inspirational people. And it's been a fantastic place to think about music and its connection to many other parts of life and also technologies which weren't necessarily imagined for music. How can we bring them into music? So uh, in the short time I have today, I wanted to talk about engagement, just what, what we might do on stage to get audiences really excited. Participation, the thing that we're all interested in, how can we go past just audience there and, and performers here and get everybody involved in touching music and, and uh, being part of it somehow. Creativity, which interests me a great deal uh, since I'm a composer at the origin. How can people with or without training make their own original music, not just perform other people's music? Uh, and the key to everything, I think, and I've heard it come up this morning a few times, is a new model of collaboration. How can we break down boundaries between who are experts and who aren't experts in a new way? I think it's very important, and I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples. 
Uh, so very quickly, let me start with uh, stages. Uh, I could talk a lot about this. I'll just give you a little uh, glimpse. My general idea is, can we use technology to allow performers on stage to be very natural, but to extend the range of what you can do as a, as a performer in such a way that you just grab the audience in a different way? So one of the technologies that I've been very interested in developing is called Hyper Instruments. This is Yo-Yo Ma, somebody I work with quite a bit. The general idea is to take a great performer, a traditional instrument, put technology on around the instrument so that the instrument knows what is being played, but more importantly, how it's being played. What's the interpretation, what's the feeling, what's important, so that if Yo-Yo, for instance, plays a certain note with more emphasis, or pushes to a downbeat, or relaxes, this might change the sound of the instrument, or it might take the melody and turn it into a whole orchestra, all things that he can control or, or anybody can control. So I'll show you just one quick example of a, more, more, a very recent project that I did last year. This is a young cellist named Peter Gregson from the UK. He's using a regular uh, acoustic cello, nothing on the cello, a very special bow that measures everything about the bow, the speed, the pressure, the position. Uh, and the bow is a kind of instrument that lets him turn the cello into other things. So this is all done live. When he plays the cello sound, it's called spheres and splinters. Sometimes it takes the cello sound and makes the audience feel like they're inside the cello. Other times it splits up the cello into tiny microscopic fragments so they fly all over. There are hundreds of speakers in the room. And there's a, it also controls a forest of uh, lights which reflects the way he's playing. So this is just a tiny bit of uh, Spheres and Splinters, uh, 30 seconds or so. what one performer can do with kind of a traditional instrument. Um, actually, there's a new CD that uh, just came out, which has a series of uh, recent pieces of mine with orchestra um, and, and these hyper instruments. If anybody's interested, I can tell you a little more about that. Wanted to give you a glimpse of a next stage of what to do on stage. Um, I've done a lot of opera over the years, partly because opera as a composer is a way of having music be at the center of a world that involves all the senses. Uh, the most recent opera, uh, which is called Death and the Powers, uh, was commissioned by Prince Albert of Monaco, uh, opened in the Monaco Opera House. A year ago, it was pretty strange to do one of the world's wildest operas in that particular opera house, but uh, <laughs> I accepted the, the, uh, <laughs> the request, so that's what we did. Um, but the idea here um, was actually to make an entire stage that came alive. In fact, we thought of a story where the stage, the physical stage, is actually the main character. It's about a man who wants to live forever, so he figures out a way to download everything about himself into his environment. He actually leaves the stage. Uh, James Maddalena, who you might know as the baritone who uh, uh, started the, the role of Nixon in Nixon in China, he's very, very well known. He starts on stage, but then he says, I'm leaving, I'm disappearing everything about myself will stay. So he goes off stage, he's in the orchestra pit for the rest of the show until the very end. But we measure everything about him and the walls, the stage, a series of robots that are like, um, let's see, I think I have pictures of the robots up. Yeah, we love the robots actually there. Um, they're, they're characters that interact with all the actors. Um, the stage itself is made up of gigantic walls that move on their own, that show images objects like a, a big chandelier that looks like a light chandelier but is actually a big robotic music instrument. These all come alive with his voice, with his expression, with his soul, with his feeling through his movements, and, but there's no person there. And in fact, the opera's about what everybody else, his family, his friends, uh, are going to do when they have to relate to the environment instead of to him. Is this really him? Do they want to follow him? Here's just a tiny glimpse of, of that opera and, a, and of a stage uh, which comes alive in a new way. No! I have billions of bucks! And 
I can still sign checks. Now, I always learn unusual things when I make a crazy project like this. Uh, sometimes the things you expect come out of it, sometimes they don't. But in building these kind of instruments along the way, it became clear to me that you could make a similar instrument that could be tried by somebody who wasn't Yo-Yo Ma or wasn't an opera singer, could be used by anybody. So I've been developing that kind of work in parallel. Um, the first thing that came out of the cello project was we, we realized that by measuring the bow, we used electricity, and it also measured the movement of the body. So we built a chair, that's Bono from U2, who we work with a lot. Um, when you sit on this chair, your body touches the metal, electricity comes out of your body. Um, it messes up your hair like this is one problem, but, <laughs> but, uh, but, bes <laughs> but besides that, the, the, the sensors on the chair measure exactly where your gesture is. So it becomes an instrument where you don't need to have a lot of skill like on the cello, but actually if you understand the musical material, you can do remarkable things with it. So someone like Bono or Prince or, or people like going on stage with this, but we can also put it in a public context. So we made a, a project called the Brain Opera, uh, which is kind of an orchestra for anybody to experiment with music, with harmony and, and singing and, and melody and texture. Uh, we opened that in New York, toured it around the world, and it's actually, for those of you who've been to the Haus der Musik in uh, Vienna, uh, it has been on exhibit there for about 10 years now. I think it's about to stop being on exhibit, so you, you have a couple of months to go see it. But it's an experiment in getting the general public to try music on their own. The surprising thing that came out of this is that uh, Guitar Hero and Rock Band uh, both came out of my laboratory, came out of the work that we built for these interactive instruments. Uh, so this idea, you know, I'm not going to uh, try to sell you on Guitar Hero or Rock Band. I think there are good things about them and many, many limitations. But I think it does show that there's an interest in the general public to have some way of, of participating in a live musical experience if we can do it the right way. We've been trying to think about how to take what's good about Guitar Hero and Rock Band and make it much more serious, something where you can really learn about music. So we have a project called Toy Symphony where we develop instruments for children, especially in contact with symphony orchestras. Children are mentored by orchestras, are uh, performing pieces with orchestras. Um, the, the squeezy instruments for very young children allow you to um, use touching and squeezing of that ball to do things like just play with intensity, Oh, or timbre, or maybe the shape of a phrase, something like that. Um, and the beat bugs in the middle, I'll show you a little video of those. Those are um, rhythm instruments where you tap the top of it, tap in your rhythm, it grabs your rhythm, plays it back. You change the rhythm by bending the two little antennas. We call them beat bugs because they look a little like bugs with antenna. Um, they're designed to be played in groups, so if you point your beat bug at your friend and tap it, your rhythm jumps to the other beat bug, and then maybe I have to vary it or play with it. The best is, is to see this. This is actually um, on uh, the, from those of, uh, those of you from the UK. Uh, we actually were on the Blue Peter uh, show on BBC TV, which is a, a great show. Um, this is just a little performance of uh, beat bugs. Uh, and as you'll see, we usually have uh, about six children and two adults, and I got to be one of the adults in this one. So.
Oh, it's good so luck we, on June the 2nd. Oh, so we designed that, obviously, to learn about rhythm and sharing rhythm, but also to play in groups and to listen to each other. There are a lot of uh, applications, and uh, asked young composers to write pieces for these beat bugs to be used uh, with orchestra. Um, and there are a variety of other uh, things that we're experimenting with now. I, you may very well have talked about this kind of thing over the last day or two. Th th these aren't rocket science, but especially with mobile devices and, and maybe something as big as an iPad, there's so many things that you can do to add value and interest to a concert experience for people of all ages. So one obvious thing is to bring in your own mobile device and have program notes, different kinds of program notes, might be uh, backstory or something following the score, available on your own device while you're listening to a concert. Um, so. Uh, you can imagine the score itself being streamed in synchrony with the music, the update score. You can imagine many cameras, most concert halls now have multiple cameras. You can imagine being able to choose a camera angle for a close-up on your iPad or device. Uh, so we're starting to build this. Um, it might be fun uh, for people to see, we do so much measuring in our lab and other labs of what it's like when a performer is playing. You know, we measure Yo-Yo Ma, we know something about uh, the, the way his muscles work, something about the angle of the bow. Might be interesting both to be able to look at data from different performers, maybe look at the synchrony of data for performers. Uh, it's pretty easy to measure things like heartbeat for groups of people now. Um, is the orchestra, are, are their hearts beating at the same time? Are they, is somebody thinking about something else? You could measure their, uh, <laughs> their thoughts pretty soon. Um, Real-time voting is kind of silly, but a lot of, a lot of younger musicians I know, uh, especially people who play in smaller venues, allow people to tweet during a concert these days, and you might have people, you might have people saying, you know, I'd like to hear this piece next, or um, I hate your performance, stop that right now, something. Um, but, you know, they're, they're easy ways to use texting back and forth between an audience and people on stage uh, to just have a sense about what people like, and uh, that might turn out to be voting. Um, actually, a lot of voting, uh, there's more, more and more fairly simple and inexpensive ways of measuring people's preferences without texting. So at the Media Lab, for instance, there's a lot of work going on now on affective computing. Um, there are little gloves that you put on. Um, th these are actually made commercially now. And uh, they basically show how interested you are in something. Um, <laughs> it can be pretty depressing if you're talking in front of a room. <laughs> and all the lights are off. It happens. Um, but, but you know, you, you can imagine something where instead of somebody saying, I want more of this, a particular thing happens and it just starts glowing and you say, well, like, okay, they love Mahler, let's do another, let's do an encore or let's um, play it slower so it lasts longer, I don't know. Um, but you, you could measure things. Um, and one thing that's, again, very, very practical that we're talking about with the Boston Symphony is it's pretty easy uh, to either ask questions online, to get questions when people are in a concert, and to imagine all kinds of material that you could prepare for somebody ahead of coming to a concert. So um, this little uh, display here is something which is actually commercially available by Spotify, the, uh, the online music company. But uh, what it does is it, it says, I would like a playlist that has this particular mood over one hour. Go into my, all my music on my iPod and pick the pieces which will give me that experience. It does it automatically. But you can imagine knowing that somebody's going to come to your concert in a, in a week and you can l do all kinds of things. Ask a few questions, look at their playlist, look at the way they've re responded to other concerts and simply send them automatically a group, uh, an, an assortment of things to listen to in preparation to come to the concert. And maybe, maybe they know the repertoire very well and, they, and they're different performances, different interpretations. Maybe they don't know it at all and they, they need some kind of background in order to get there. But um, th this is something that I think really could be built on is not very difficult to do. Um, the way halls are built, uh, as you all know, th there are many beautiful halls being built. There are not so many halls which really have radically different conceptions about what people are supposed to do in the hall. Um, the New World Symphony, I'm sure you know about. Uh, it's, it's Frank Gehry's latest concert hall in Miami. And it really does have some interesting... I, I met the um, executive director of it just the other day. And um, the two interesting things about it are that it was designed so that all of the surfaces uh, pretty much in the room are designed to be projection surfaces. And they're not... Um, you know, a screen comes down. It's literally seven gigantic panels in the ceiling that are very beautiful, but they're projectors all around, and they're sim it's simply taken for granted that part of a concert in the future is going to be visual, and you need the possibility of throwing images everywhere with a great deal of complexity. 
The other thing they did at the, at the New World Symphony, it's, it's possible because it's in Miami, the weather's very nice, but they did put windows all over, including in the concert hall, which means that it's very easy for the public to come and simply watch from the outside and see what's happening and watch rehearsal, watch a concert. But they also have an enormous surface outside with very, very high quality projection. And um, it's in this space down here. There's a park that fits about 2,000 people with really, really good audio, hundreds of loudspeakers. And what it allows people to do is to come sit in this park outside and live watch the concert that's going on inside. And they say that they have about 30 times as many people who see the concerts from outside, even from far away, driving by on the freeway. I mean, it's America, but you know. Um, driving by on the freeway, actually get glimpses of the concert, then actually go inside. So this idea that your concert hall might be turned inside out or might somehow reflect somewhere else is really important. Um, and we all know about, uh, you know, I'm sure most of you are working with some kind of streaming or some kind of filming for your event that goes somewhere else, which is all well and good. I'm pretty convinced that we probably have to invent a new form to allow something that's happening live here to have a real impact somewhere else. So we're trying ways of doing that. The most radical thing we're doing right now is, um, how many of you have heard of Punch Drunk? Oh, great, you're in for a, a real treat. Go, go uh, Google, I, I don't know. Anyway, Google Punch Drunk after we're here. Punch Drunk uh, is, I think, the most interesting English language theater group in the world right now. They're based in London, they're very young, they're all about 30 years old. And uh, they specialize, uh, they're the most radical theater group uh, that, that takes their experiences off the stage, puts them in big spaces, and lets the public explore the space. So they have a show in New York right now called Sleep No More. It's based on Shakespeare's Macbeth. It takes place in a gigantic warehouse with 150 separate rooms. Um, you go in, everybody gets a mask, and each person individually explores this space for as long as you want to on your own. There's no program. That you, there's nothing that tells you you have to find a particular thing. There are many things that are secret that you never find, but it's a huge hit in New York. It will run for many years, I think. What, we got a grant with Punch Drunk from the National Endowment of Science, Technology, and the Arts in the UK to work on a project now where we're, we're making an online, a, a way to experience this amazing show online it's very, very difficult. We, you, can, you, you can't possibly stream this and just show a camera walking through it. It wouldn't capture it at all. So what we're doing is having one live participant, an audience member, connect with one person online. We do this in many pairs. And the two of them go through the exhibit together. And each of them has different bits of information. The person in the space is accumulating live information. The person online has a map, has backstory. And then there are thousands and thousands of people who can watch over the shoulder of the person online. So we're building this right now. Uh, we launch it in May. So um, if I, I, can, I can give you my card to keep in touch with this. It should be an interesting experiment in a different way to experience something when you're not there. Let's see. So creativity, um, I believe that one of the most wonderful things in life is seeing life through your own eyes, uh, making your own decisions, making things to respond to the world around you. Music is one of the most fantastic ways to experiment in creativity. We try to do this in many ways. Um, our, we have a, a software system called Hyperscore, which uh, was designed to use line and color, no necessary knowledge of music uh, notation or music theory, to let anybody write original pieces of music. You use this interface to make music, push a button, it writes out real notes so instruments can play. Um, and here's just a little video of how Hyperscore works. Hyperscore is a computer program that gives children the power to compose. They only have to be able to draw a line. It allows you to compose a piece of music uh, without knowing anything about the rules of music or without knowing musical notation. Um, it uses a, a, a graphic language that we developed uh, and you draw and paint on the screen and your marks are turned into music. As children change the shape, length, colour and position of their lines, they create music. The software acts as a translator, taking the kids' designs and turning them into musical scores, the language of professional musicians. It all sounds impressive in theory. How does it sound in reality?
So that was a that was a nine year old nine year old girl from Glasgow, from really inner city, very very poor neighborhood. Never done anything in music before. Uh, the BBC Scottish Symphony Orchestra broadcast on Radio Three and, and BBC. So this kind of thing really does work. We have a lot to learn about how to make this kind of program, the pedagogy around it, even better. But it is possible to get people making amazing things if the context is right and if the professionals take it seriously. Um, we're pushing this to the next level right now. Does, designing something called media scores, what would happen if you could make music, but you could also take a story and take images and take video and make an entire opera out of, uh, on your own? So we're working uh, on a project called Personal Opera um, with uh, the Royal Opera House Covent Garden in London. Uh, and the idea here is instead of working with children, we're working with seniors, with older people who have many, many stories to tell, but haven't necessarily been asked. So uh, we did our first uh, workshop uh, at the Royal Opera House um, in September. We brought together a group of seniors from all over London, broke people into groups of four, uh, used pictures from the last Olympics in London, 1948, simple devices. We used hyperscore, um, simple visuals like uh, projections. Um, had instrumentalists there so people could make their hyperscore pieces and then make melodies out of their stories with a soprano right there willing to try them out. Um, we asked everybody who participated to act as part of their narratives. Um, everybody, all the stories were about sports and they were all tragic for some reason. Um, this was my favorite. These were three people. The guy on the right had gone to the 1948 Olympics with his entire village because one of the people in the village um, was running in, in the 100 meter race. And uh, they all were, were, were cheering him on. So they all went and the, guy, the race started and they were all cheering, cheering, cheering. And the more the race went on, the person in their village was farther and farther back. And he came in, where's the slide? He came in last. <laughs> and they made a one and a half minute opera about this in one day that was a knockout. We made six of these operas and um, was one of the most incredible, wonderful experiences I've ever done. So we're starting a new project. I was there yesterday at the Royal Opera House. We're starting a big project around personal opera, which will bubble up at the Olympics this summer. We should have a whole set of these for people to listen to. Last thing, just a glimpse at one more idea is, um, Everything I've mentioned so far is, a, is still a kind of uh, traditional mentorship model. You know, uh, they're, they're a team of expert pedagogues who are working with people who are not professional as an orchestra working with children. Um, they're people who know more than other people. I really think that the way to move forward in this field is to set up environments where even though people may come with different backgrounds, different experience, different ages, everybody's trying to solve a problem together that everybody has an investment, everybody has something to learn, and that it doesn't go just one way. I think it's really, really important. And this, we're starting to see this in our culture. I don't know if you've heard of RJ DJ yet. They're a young company in London that make mobile apps, music mobile apps, based on some of our software, but it's a great company. What they basically do is they make songs that are only half finished when they get to you. So you buy them. Every time you play them on your iPhone or whatever device, they play differently, so they're designed to change, but they also look at the way that you use your iPhone, if, if you shake it, if you turn it upside down, if you touch it. So it's a kind of collaboration in a way between the music that's been composed and the way you use it. So they kind of think of it as a soundtrack to your everyday life. It's successful, it's kind of cool, it's not all that great, but it's the beginning of something. You might have seen Bjork's new project, Biophilia. This is another, let's see, did I have two Bjork slides? Oh, I guess I just have one Bjork slide. Um, so Bjork just came out with a new CD. She's on tour um, with, you know, you can kind of see some interactive music. But the big thing she tried to do in this new project is that every song on the CD has an I, I, iPad app. So um, you can listen to the song, but you can also change a variety of ways of visualizing the song. And then you can take a visualization like this and play with the music. You know, you can maybe stop it, um, try some of the different tracks. And it's kind of interesting, but I don't know if any of you have tried it. Um, it's not that interesting. And uh, the reason it's not that interesting is not because she's not a good musician, but because she didn't really want you to 
touch her music very much. And I think her lawyers didn't want you to either. You know, you can, you can just touch a little bit, but it's not really a collaboration. It's not really anything very creative you can do. And um, there's another thing coming out now, which is kind of the opposite. Hans Zimmer, the film composer, is writing the music for the new Batman movie. And he has a big website where he's inviting anybody in the world to send sounds that, you know, the idea is send us your sound, especially your voice, and we will use it, you will be part of the new Batman movie. You know, it's, we're making this together. But, you know, you can imagine that, well, you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> you probably won't be able to find your voice. So typically, I decided that there's something, there's something I want to try to see, if, you know, at least to see if something different is possible. So I'm composer in residence this next year with the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, and um, they asked me, we're, they're doing different music of mine, but they asked me to write a new piece, and what I decided to do is to propose uh, to the city of Toronto uh, to create a symphony from the very first note to the performance where the entire city of Toronto and myself will collaborate to make this piece. And um, we're actually working with um, uh, Google to make this happen because it's, it's not easy to figure out. It, none of this is easy. What does it mean to make decisions together? Uh, do we make decisions on every note? Do we make decisions on the form? What does it mean to have a place where, I mean, it could be 10,000 people, it could be, could be five people, but it could be a lot of people, maybe. Um, how do you have a space online where people can share ideas and, and discuss? And, um, but my idea is that if we do this right, um, it really is a project where it's part, it's my piece, but it's also really the piece of everybody who contributed, and um, I'm willing to give up a certain amount of my autonomy to have that happen. So we'll see. March 2013 is the premiere. I'm really scared about this, but it's worth following. You may learn something from it. I'll probably learn a lot from it and the bad things, but... Uh, and then there happen to be a lot of orchestras right now who are interested in having big experiments like this. So we're going to do something slightly different with Kent Nagano in Montreal, and I'm developing a close, close relationship with uh, Gustavo Dudamel in Los Angeles. That's Gustavo with me and my two daughters, actually, recently. Um, so to end, I just wanted to say that all of this work I've presented doesn't just represent a new kind of pedagogy, it just doesn't just represent a new kind of openness to audiences. I really think it represents a fundamentally different way of thinking about how all the parts of the musical world, the musical ecology, have to work together. I think we, we're, we're way past a stage where I, as a composer, can sit in my room and finish a piece and send it out in the world and forget about it when it goes out there, or that an audience can come to a concert not knowing anything ahead of time, expect to be entertained, and then leave. Or that you programming things can program without thinking about how all these work together, to say nothing of the music business, you know, where, where, how is money generated out of all of this. I think we have to rethink from the bottom up um, how each force involved in making a musical culture can be much more interrelated than before, can be much more collaborative than before, both in decision making, in the experience itself, and probably in generating income and, and the possibility to, to do new work. That's what really interests me, and maybe that's something that we can talk a little bit about during the panel. Uh, thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.